The Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series is underwritten by the Polsky Family Supporting Foundation in partnership with the Johnson County Community College Foundation, which seeks to educate and empower the public in the areas of health, financial independence, and topical issues not covered elsewhere. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polsky Practical Personal Enrichment Series. I'm Emily Bierman, and before we get started, I'd just like to request that you turn off any cell phones or other noisemakers you may have brought with you tonight so we don't disturb others during the program. Thank you. Ah, oh, listen to that. They're going off as we speak. Also, um, I wanted just to give you a little background on the series. The Polsky series is underwritten by the Norman and Elaine Polsky Family Supporting Foundation within the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation in partnership with Johnson County Community College. This set of topics are not being offered anywhere else where successful local professionals share their knowledge to benefit all of us. Norman and Elaine Polsky's name, of course, graces the Polsky Theater, which is next door to where we are tonight in Yardley Hall, and we certainly want to thank them for their generosity, which also brings you the Polsky Series. The Polsky Family Supporting Foundation supports organizations across Kansas City and the nation, enriching our community and communities around the world. Thanks also to our JCCC TV and Carlson Center production crews for their assistance tonight. You'll notice that our program is being taped for broadcast, and you can find us on Time Warner and Sure West Channel 17 or Comcast Channel 22. We also have a YouTube channel at the college now, which the Polsky series programs from this point forward will be carried on. So you can find that at www.jccc.edu uh, on our YouTube channel. Now for the packet that you were given when you came in this evening. On the left-hand side, you'll find information honoring Norman Polsky's legacy, including biographical information for Norman and Elaine Polsky, a list of endowments the Polsky Foundation supports, his kindness quotes, uh, making the most of your doctor's visits, a lot of the material in that booklet comes from past Polsky series presentations, so we hope that you'll enjoy reading it. There's also, behind that booklet, a flyer for our next program in the Polsky series, which will feature Adam Bold. Adam will be talking about the Ten Commandments of Investing, How to Build Your Personal Wealth, and that will be on Wednesday, October the 12th at 7 o'clock. Uh, that will be held next door in the Polsky Theater, unless we have great response like we did tonight when we may remove to, Mar to Yardley Hall. On the right-hand side of the packet is information specific to tonight's presentation by Peter Newman. Uh, you'll find several flyers behind the main packet of information, and the, the last flyer there is about Peter's financial cruise. You may have seen some information about that in the lobby as well. So if you want to sign up for the cruise, which happens uh, end of May, early June next year, you'll want to uh, find out more about that before you leave tonight. There are also a couple of cards there. The blue card is for questions for the speaker. If you have any questions during the presentation, write in on that card, and we'll be coming around to pick those up while Peter is speaking. And then there will be about a 15-minute question and answer period towards the end of the program. We'll do our best to get to all the questions tonight, but Peter did want me to mention to you that he will be willing to stay after the program for a little while. So if there's something we don't cover in the questions that are asked, uh, you're welcome to stay and ask him personally for a little while. Now, not till midnight, because stuff shuts off around here about 11 o'clock, so, okay. Um, and remember, we're no longer issuing tickets for the Polsky series. We are taking RSVPs. 
So add yourself to the mailing list or to our email list on the green card that's in your packet. Um, that card can also be used to give us feedback so we can improve for the next time. You can suggest future topics and that sort of thing. So please hand that to an usher before you leave tonight. You can also add yourself to our, mail, our email list by sending an email to polskiseries at jccc.edu, and then we've got you in our system. So feel uh, welcome to do that. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you know him best as the host of one of Kansas City's most listened to financial programs, Moneyline, heard every Saturday morning from 11 to 1 on KMBZ 980 AM. He has over 30 years experience in financial planning and tax preparation, and he has his own firm, Peter Newman CPA Chartered, located in the Windmill Village Office Park at 95th and Metcalf in Overland Park. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Peter Newman. Thank you, Emma. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Certainly glad to see so many of you here. On today's program, we've really got a lot of subjects to talk about, as we always do. Obviously, money, taxes, and maybe more importantly, what's going on in the economy. You know, none of us are particularly happy with what's going on, whether it's your house or whether it's your portfolio. You're worried, and rightfully so. So we're certainly going to talk about that. But before I start talking about the main subjects, I want to take a break for just a minute. About a year ago, actually September the 1st, I stood before you in the Polsky Theater, and I mentioned that uh, Norman Polsky was not doing well. And you remember I asked that you take a minute out and pray. Unfortunately, our prayers did not help. The Lord wanted Norman before we could continue to benefit from all the good things he's done for us. You know, I can think of a lot of human beings that I either know personally or that I've read about who like to help others. But truly, Norman Polsky was one of a kind. Here was a man who grew up from nothing. And that's the beauty of America, isn't it? You can come from poor beginnings like I did as well. And hopefully, if you work hard, and you spend a lot of time, and more importantly, you have a loving wife who helps you, you can accomplish something. And that's the beauty of good old America. We're one of a kind. No matter how much our economic problems may be, America is America. And it will always be that. But having said that, with Norm having passed away, we now turn to his sweet wife, Elaine Polsky, who also, as we speak tonight, is not doing so well. And I only can say that I hope and pray that the Lord listens closer to us this year than he did last time and gives Elaine many, many more good days, months, and years. I really always have thought great. I, in fact, I know, I've known Norman personally for a lot of years. In fact, Bev and I remember when he went with us on one of our financial planning cruises. I wish I had time to tell you about it, but I'm not going to discuss that. So this evening, as we start the program, I want to first talk and ask you a question, and that is, when you think about the problems that we're having today, what is the main thing that comes to your mind? Is it the debt that we have? Is it the value of our securities that have declined? Is it unemployment? What would, it, what would you say is the major problem we have today? Throw me an answer. Taxes. I'm sorry? Taxes. Taxes. Well, you know I'm going to agree with that. Yeah. Uh, no question about that. <laughs> but, but there's so many different answers. But really, in my opinion, there's only one answer. Government. <laughs> that is, in my opinion, the main problem with America. You know, thank you. Well, at least, at least I know one thing some of you agree with me, right? But really and truly, it's just a pitiful shame that our government has never truly ever solved a problem. No, I'm not trying to be funny. It's true. Government creates problems. They do not create wealth. They destroy wealth. They do not, as we've just heard from Mr. Obama, he thinks so, I don't think so, does not create jobs. And if they do, they do it with what? More additional debt. 
So the bottom line is, as I view it, government is the number one. And I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations. But beyond that, it would be nice, wouldn't it, if we had legislators who weren't worried about the Republican Party, who weren't worried about the Democratic Party, who weren't worried about Missouri, who weren't worried about Kansas, but were worried about America. You know, we're one people. You know, why can't we on God's green earth get our elected officials to agree on anything? Look at what happened. The debt crisis, right? Remember the date, August the 2nd? What happened? Last minute, right? In fact, we were about five hours away from D time, and they finally passed something that was worthless anyway. I mean, it was worthless. The so-called solution to the debt crisis didn't do anything but defer the problem another two years. What happened? They basically did the following. What was agreed upon was that, number one, we would let Mr. Obama spend another roughly $2.3 billion. We gave him another open door. Hey, Uncle Buddy, pay, let, us, let us incur more debt. And by the way, he's great at that. He really is. And by the way, one thing I do want to me mention before I digress here. I'm not for the Republicans. I'm not for the Democrats. I don't care who caused the problem. The question is, is how do we resolve the problems? And that's, that's what we got to address ourselves. But having said that, what did we really accomplish by that so-called temporary solution to the debt crisis? Well, here's the game, and you know it by now, hopefully. Number one, we in fact have said that by November 23rd, the super committee, heck, if they can't answer the question in Congress, how is the super committee going to solve anything? They're not going to solve a well, I'm on TV, so I won't say the word. But they're not going to solve a thing. I'll guarantee you they will not solve a thing. And they're supposed to send on November 23rd to Congress their, quote, suggestions. I was going to use the word solution, but I can't do that. They're going to send their suggestion to Congress. Now, if something doesn't get, by, get done by December 23rd, what happens? there's automatically going to be a one point, roughly $2 trillion reduction in spending. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I doubt that seriously. The bottom line is half of it's going to come from defense, half of it's going to come from other money matters, but not Social Security and not Medicare. So we got beyond that hurdle. But there's so many other problems that have arisen, again, all caused by your government, and mine as well. Let's look back about three or four years ago. If you remember, everything was really going rosy, wasn't it? Home prices were skyrocketing. Everybody was happy. Nobody was worried. And then Congress and the government created a problem. They said, we need to make sure that people in the low income categories, in fact, they required, Fannie and Freddie required, that they make loans, home loans, to people who couldn't really afford them. 50% plus had to go to people in mid to low income categories. And on top of that, Congress enacted all this legislation to make it even worse. Gave them all these tax benefits, all the things that they felt was appropriate to be done, and what happened? Everything skyrocketed like crazy, and then we got hit. And when we got hit, we got hit terribly, terribly hard. Again, caused mainly, not only, but mainly by government. If they just had kept their blank hands out of it and let the system work, it would have worked. For example, prior to that time, prior to the first recession, the recent recession, it wasn't exactly easy to get a loan but it was a lot simpler to get a loan. You could get a loan from just about anybody. They kind of were, they kind of looked to the side in terms of making loans. And that's exactly what happened. Everybody went and got loans. Prices of homes skyrocketed. And what did, what did uh, uh, Greenspan say? Hey, listen, look at the value of your homes. Go out and borrow more. What? Borrow more? And this is what God is saying. Listen, for most of you who are probably my age or younger, I was going to say older, but probably younger, looks to me like when I look at you, you're probably all members of Social Security in good standing. Uh, 
most of you will remember when we were kids, you bought a home, you had a loan. And by the way, in our day, the loan rates was not 3%. I can remember when Bev and I first bought our home, we were hoping that we'd be able to get a loan for under 10%. We got a loan at nine and seven eighths. I came home and I said, Bev, we got it made. We got nine and seven eighths percent. What a wonderful deal, right? But back in our day, you couldn't go in and get an equity loan. You had to live with the loan you could refinance. And we didn't have a hundred different variety of loans. We had a 15 and a 30 and that was it. So in reality, we've created a mess, but that mess, in my opinion, has been caused by Congress. And I think it'll continue to do that. And I'm going to talk a little bit as well later about what we see in terms of the additional legislation. For example, the jobs creation bill that uh, we're going to get. Do you really think that jobs creation bill is really going to create employment? Don't count on it. I know it's the same day that that proposal came out. Right away, the experts. Here's what they said. Number one, it will cause GDP, gross domestic product, to increase by at least 2%. That ain't gonna happen. It'll cause the unemployment rate to decline by at least 1% and will create roughly 1.9 million jobs. By the way, all Obama did in this was nothing more than what he'd done before. You know, we had a stimulus bill. What was it supposed to do? It was supposed to help with the infrastructure. That's what we're talking about in this bill. We're supposed to be spending roughly $140 billion for infrastructure. We're supposed to create additional $240 billion by doing what? Reducing Social Security taxes. What are they going to do? The proposal is that we're going to reduce the Social Security taxes that employers and employees pay and cut it in half. So if a person is making $50,000 in salary, he's in effect going to be able to have $1,500 more money to take home pay. Is that going to create more jobs? I doubt it. I don't think so. It hasn't worked before. Right now in the current year, we already have a roughly 2% difference that the employees pay in. And the other question is, what's it going to do to Social Security? You know, I know what he's saying. I know what Obama... No, no problem. We'll take it out of the general fund. What fund? There's no money in there. You know, he always says, we're going to get it here, we're going to get it there, but where are we really going to get it? Well, we're not going to get it. We're going to create more debt, we're going to create more problems, and it's an ongoing headache. By having this two-year, quote, extension of the debt, all we have done is face the inevitable. It's just delayed what will certainly happen, in my opinion. And I'll tell you more about what I think is going to happen. Okay, well, having given you the first part of what my thoughts are. Hey, by the way, that reminds me, you know, when you think of what's going on in this world right now, it kind of reminds me of a battleship out at sea. The ship is going in the wrong direction. It's lost its rudder, and the commander doesn't know how to solve it. That's the basic line. And by the way, it also reminds me of this. Remember in the good old days when we had Reagan? And remember, he, he had a major problem, too. It got resolved. How did he do it? He cut taxes, by the way. He did not increase taxes. And do you remember when we had Reagan, we also had some very popular people. For example, remember Johnny Cash? Right? Remember Bob Hope? Well, what do we have today? We got Obama, no cash, no hope. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, but that, that, that's, that's basically where we are today. Okay, well, having said that, let me, uh, let me start and dig into some of the problems that we've got. Let's go over here. This is something that one of my employees showed to me, and I thought it was outstanding. This is where we currently are in the real world. Right now, our government takes in $2.2 trillion in income every year, and I'm going to show you from what sources that comes. And we spend roughly $3.8 trillion. And you can see it right up there, $3.8 trillion. Our current outstanding debt for the current year, our deficit, is going to be somewhere between $1.5 to $1.6 trillion. And understand, when this was done on August the 2nd, the outstanding debt of the country was $14.3 
$8 trillion. You know what that debt is? And we can, uh, six weeks later, it is now $14.8 trillion as we speak this evening. Now, those are a lot of big numbers. Let's try to get this down to the real world. Let's knock off some zeros, eight zeros, out of those numbers, and let's look at the Smith family in the same condition, God forbid, as our federal government. Now look at it. The Smith family has annual income, $22,000. That's comparable to that $2.2 trillion after knocking off eight zeros. The current expenditure of the Smith family is $38,000. And their shortage is $16,000. That's what your government looks like, by the way, except adding on eight zeros. And the bottom line is that that family owes an additional $143,000. You think they're going to survive? I don't think so. I don't think so. Now, with the recent debt crisis, this means right now that the nation's debt will have probably $16.5 trillion by the time that, uh, that Obama gets out, he gets out of office. Revenues are not likely going to increase, or very unlikely, and the $14.3 trillion in debt is equal to $46,000 for each single American. Is that astonishing? How can we possibly recover from that? It's, in my opinion, and I, you know, I'm, I leave it to our legislators, and by the way, those good congressmen and women you elect. You know, I can't believe the kind of people we elect to Congress. You know, I mean, I really can't. These people have absolutely no common sense. Most of them have no business sense. You know, you got to run the government like a business, right? In the business world, if you can't get enough revenue, if you can't live within your means, if you can't live within your budget, what happens? You go under. Instead, the kind of people we ought to have are people who have run businesses, who know and how have learned to live within their budget, within their means. The government, in fact, I just read it, and you heard it today as well, about all this money that the Fed and the Reserve is spending on meals and entertainment. Did you hear a cup of coffee, $16? I mean, you know, crazy, 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 crazy. You know, we're beyond that time. We are, you and I, we lived in the decade of excess, and we were lucky. I feel sorry for our kids. They're going to be burdened with huge problems. Let's look at what this thing looks like in terms of receipts. This is how the government gets its money. Individual income taxes, 42%, Social Security, 40 etc., for roughly 2.162, I round it, 2.2 trillion. Now let's look at the expenditure. And of course, our problem is expenditures, right? True, we don't have enough income, but the big problem is this area of expenditures. We can't get the government to get to a balanced budget. They refuse to do that. Why? Because they waste. So I'm going to show you what kind of things we're talking about that we waste. But look at what goes on. Medicare and Social Security. The entitlement programs. 43%. Deadly. And the reason that it's deadly is because the people that take these benefit programs don't know what they're doing. Social Security. Let's look at that just a minute. In 1935, when the first uh, Social Security checks went out, the idea was that we should provide money to those people who need it, who are in trouble, who don't have enough assets to live on. It wasn't meant that this kind of money should go to uh, Donald Trump. It didn't mean it should go to uh, any of the wealthy people that we have, Warren Buffett. You know, it wasn't meant to go to them, but it does. And do you know how long it takes the average American on Social Security to recover everything he's put in? Five years. So if you live beyond the age of 70, and let's say you start at 66 or 71, you've got all your money back. The rest is all gravy train. Well, why should these wealthy be getting that gravy train? They don't need it. They, honest to God, don't need it. We have plenty of people in this city. I'll guarantee you, 
who don't need the money to live on. But they take it anyway. So why don't we do something intelligent for a change? Could it be in the realm of possibility that the government could do one thing intelligent? It's not difficult. What we'd simply say is that if you've got a net worth of X dollars or you've got an income of Y dollars, we'd set up certain parameters. We'd say, hey, listen, here's what we're going to do for you. You put in X dollars, we're going to give it back to you. And we'll give you a little interest, 3 4%. We're not going to let you lose it. God forbid we should let them lose it. But you're not going to lose it. And then we'll make the money available for people who really, truly need it. I can't comprehend, because I don't know the figures, of how much we might save. What about Medicare? Medicare, unfortunately, as you can see, 23%. And it's going to get worse, not better. But again, do you think that these wealthy people need that? No. You know, this was meant to help people who need to have help. And we shouldn't be paying all their medical bills. And, you know, recently, by the way, it used to be that for Medicare, no matter who you were, no matter how much money you paid, the premium was exactly the same. This last year it was $96.40. If you'd been having a Medicare right along, it came out of your Social Security check. If you did it for the first time, it was $112 or $113. That's all they paid. So finally they got smart. They said, oh, well, if you're really wealthy, we're going to jack up your premiums. It can be as high as $334, $335. But these two are killing us. You know, and I hate to say that because we're all seniors, but this is a huge, 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 unbelievably huge problem. And the people who are putting money in will never get us caught up. They can't. No way. And by the way, when you look at this whole issue of money, it comes from the fact that we as Americans, especially years ago, never did financial or tax planning. We just went along our merry way. When it came time to retire, we looked at our assets and said, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? I don't have enough money. 23%. Of all people on Social Security, it's their main source of income. I mean, you know, no wonder we've got problems. And they're not going to get solved by anything simple. That's for really sure. Okay, let's take a look at some of the other things here. Oops, better go over here one more. Uh, okay, plug in, find another power source. Okay, I'll have to tell the guys in back we need a power source or something. Uh, come on, guys. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see if they can straighten that out for us. Uh, let's look at something else, though. The, the bottom line to where we are today is jobs. Is that right? We want more jobs. Could I get somebody to try to help us out here on this uh, slide and see if we can... Let's see here. I don't think I got a button that says OK. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, I don't see it here. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, let, me, let me go over to the next. All right, by the way, I was talking about all of these expenditures we have. Look at this list of expenditures and how many of them are really worthless expenditures. Look at all these, and I've highlighted International Fund for Ireland. We need $17 million. Hey, do we have it available to us? No. What do we, I mean, you know, we're a wonderful country. We help everybody in the world, don't we? We're always everywhere. Hey, let's forget about the others. Let's think of America. You see all the people rushing over here helping us? Nobody. No matter where it is. But as soon as something happens someplace, right away, the government's over there. Do we have to have all these armed services people all over the world? The money we send to most of these countries, how does it come back to us? In bombs, in killings. That's what happens to our good will. But I'm just talking about things here that are very, look at all these items, things that really, truly probably don't make any sense at all. I mean, we're, we're spending money, beach replacement. We need 95 million bucks for beach replacement. That's important, right? It's critical for our well-being. I mean, and I've tried to, two, New Starts Transit, two billion. Inner city and high-speed rail grants. All of these things are for people who, are for a government, for a country that's wealthy that has money to spend. 
We do not have money to spend. You know, out of every dollar that the government spends, 40% of it is borrowed money. Out of every $100, $40 comes from money that's borrowed. So it's, it, you know, this particular list, and you've got a copy of it, by the way, $2.5 trillion of wasted money for things we don't need. And that's what's wrong with our government. Okay, now, I want to talk about a different subject for just a minute. This issue of jobs. Jobs, obviously, is the number one word. Everything we pick up today is jobs, 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 right? Right now, our unemployment rate is 15, roughly 15 million. We have another 9 million people who only have temporary or part-time jobs. That's 24 million people. 16% of our population who either has little or no income. And when you look at unemployment, what, what rate are we at in unemployment? Throw me out the number. What's our current unemployment rate? 9.1%. What's our real rate of unemployment? 165 to 17%. That's the real rate of unemployment. It's a huge, huge, huge problem. And, you know, it's interesting when we look at different parts of the country. Who's got the worst unemployment rate in the country? Well, Michigan is about the third. Nevada. Nevada, the number one, their rate currently is like 13.4%. The next one is California. They're about 12.6%. Where are we here locally? Hey, by the way, what are the best states? Anybody have an idea of what the best state unemployment-wise is? North Carolina. Yes, they have 3.6, and who's second? You won't believe this at all. Nebraska, 4.2%. Where are we here? In the state of Missouri, 8.8%. State of Kansas, 7.6%. So this is where we currently are in our unemployment problems. And the creation that we're seeing from the Obama proposal, to me, again, it's worthless. Because where is he going to find... $447 billion to do something with here. And I tell you, the other thing that bothers me is this. Not only do we have a government that wastes money, but we also take money and waste it on all kinds of things besides things that are not even realistic. How long have we now been paying unemployment benefits? Do you have any idea how many months? 99 weeks, 99 weeks altogether, roughly two years. Now we're going to go another three, uh, excuse me, three years. Another two years with this bill is going to give us roughly five years altogether. There's got to be a point at which we say we can't do it anymore. If you can't, you know, there are some people in this world, and I mean in the United States, if you give them money, eh, no problem. I'll just live on it. I don't have to do anything. You know, our system, and specifically our taxation system, punishes those who want to work and benefits those who don't want to work. That's, that's the way this system works. And it's not realistic that we should be having this sort of thing taking place. It just doesn't make sense. Well, having talked about some of these problems, and I'm not even going to go to the other ones because I've got too many other examples that I could give you. For example, in the area of housing, you know what's going on there. And by the way, you think the housing debacle is over? Oh, we got a long ways to go, folks. The current estimate is that prices will decline anywhere from another 3 to 5% within the year or two. And I truly believe that. I mean, you can see yourself. Think of all the friends that you have who are looking to sell homes. They can't. They're lopsided. Think of commercial. If you're in the commercial field, real estate is literally not moving anywhere. And we're really lucky here in, America, in this part of the country. We're doing better than most places. But the whole thing is literally shriveling and causing what I think is going to be a real catastrophe within a few years. And I've been saying that, by the way, for a good year or two. What's our gross domestic product? Anybody know what GDP means? Gross domestic problem, product? It's the sum and substance of all of our services and production that we do. In the 30s, 1930 to 1939, the Depression years, our gross domestic product was 1.4%. What was the GDP in the first quarter of the year? Do you remember when it first came out? The rate was 1.4%. By the way, they got three ties at this. 
The next time it went down about two-tenths of one percent. By the time they got through in the first quarter, our gross domestic product was four-tenths of one percent. Where are we in the second quarter? We started out first with 1.3. The next guesstimate from the government was a reduction of three, one percent. By the time we get the third and final one, our gross domestic product will probably be a half to three quarters of a percent. We're not getting it done. Not even with all the wasted money that you... And by the way, the only reason that we are where we are is because the government keeps taking our money and trying to pump it up, and the pump just ain't working. It's stalled out. It ain't getting the job done. And meanwhile, we create this god-awful debt. And that is a situation which probably is going to cause us in the long time, long run, to shrivel and fold up. And I hate to use that word, but I'm really worried to that extent. So in summary, let's look at what's going on. What is up and what's down? Consumer confidence is clearly down. The gross domestic product is down. Manufacturing is down. Home sales and home prices are down. What's down in good? Oil prices. Thank the Lord oil prices are down because if they were up, we'd be in huge, huge problems. Americans' income, by the way, is shrinking, and the value of our assets have declined, mainly due to the fact that home values have declined. What's going up? Unemployment, gold. Americans, by the way, are saving for the first time. What, what happened with Americans? They suddenly decide maybe they ought to be saving instead of spending. That's unusual, because for a long period of time, Americans were just simply not saving anything. We were the worst savers of all of the the naturalized world and the industrialized world. So it was simply not good. And by the way, who's hoarding the cash? Corporations. Banks are literally hoarding cash. It's estimated that now more than $2 trillion is being held by corporations. They're not spending it. And by the way, part of the fact that we have this unemployment is due to one other factor. Actually, two. Technology, number one. Because technology has caused a significant requirement for people to be working. We now have equipment that does it quicker, faster, and cheaper in the long run. And of course, the other problem is all of our corporations are sending overseas to get it done cheaper. Now, to me, the right solution is that if we have corporations in America that are going to take jobs overseas, we ought to assess them a penalty for doing that. There ought to be either a penalty or some other type of assessment that's made when you go overseas as an American corporation and go over there and take the jobs that we should have here. And, of course, the other problem is the unbelievable immigration that's taking place. You all know I was born overseas when I came over here in 1944. We had to do it the right way, the hard way. It took us a long time. My folks were janitors for most of their lives when they were working here. But they did it the right way. They did it the honest way. That isn't the way it is anymore. Our borders are open to everybody, and everybody's coming in, and they're wanting all the benefits that go with being an American. Every one of these are problems that we can't seem to address, we can't seem to get resolved. That's the bad news. Now let's turn to the good news for a minute. And that is... How do we manage to do something better with our money? Now, I'm going to spend some time on this. I haven't done it before. Most of you today are making 1% or 2% on your money. Is that pretty much right? You're going to your favorite bank, and they're saying, hey, we're really going to give you our best rate because you're our customer. You've been with us for five years. We're going to give you one-tenth of 1% 1 more, so they give you 1.1. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go for it. That is to use one simple word, S-T-U-P-I-D. <laughs> and the reason is there's a wonderful way to make money. About, I'm going to say 10 years ago, 8 to 10 years, I started talking about this, tax lien certificates. And I want to spend some time telling you how they work, what they're all about. And in fact, let me come over here first and show you something real quick like this is the tax lien rates in various states. Now look at this. You like Missouri, for example? 10%. By the way, Missouri just had its auction. I'm going to tell you how it works. 
In Missouri, 10%. You cannot lose money. No way, Jose. Look at Iowa. 24%. You know the best state in the union? Illinois. 36%. 18% every six months. Now let's talk about what this is all about. When a county needs its taxes, its real estate taxes, and it can't collect it from the owner of the property, there's two options. One is to simply sell the property, like we do here in Kansas, which is a deed state. The other one is to sell a lien. Now, Missouri, because they do it and they're right next to us here, does just exactly that. And here's what happens. Each county goes through and looks at its tax rolls. If an individual has not paid his real estate taxes from a period of a year to two, they're going to say, okay, you're not going to pay your tax? We're going to need the money because we need to operate the county, right? They're going to put it up for sale. Now, in Missouri, the auction takes place on the fourth Monday of every August. We just had it here a few weeks ago. And what happens is you go to the auction and they give you a listing of all the real estate that they are going to sell these tax liens for. And by the way, it doesn't require a lot of money. Think in your own right. How much are your real estate tax? Think in your own mind. What are your real estate taxes? They're not huge. In fact, probably your real estate taxes are probably somewhere in the area of 2 to 3% of the total value of your home, if you know the value of your home, which you probably don't. But the bottom line is, those are the two ways that counties get their money. Now, in this case, most counties sell tax lien, do it once a year, as I've told you. When a lien is purchased, the tax lien certificate is recorded in the county. In other words, I go over to Missouri, I, there's one out there for 2000 I decide I want it. I raise my hand at the auction. She says, I see Mr. Newman there, or number 13, if that's my number. Is there anybody else that wants it? Nobody wants it. I give them money. It's my lien. What does that do for me? It puts me in the place of the county. Now, the question is, is how am I going to collect this money? Right? That's always the question, isn't it? The 10%, by the way, is guaranteed by the state. Guaranteed by the state. The, uh, the backup to the expenditure is the real estate. So, where do we look first? We look first at the homeowner. Now, if the homeowner does not pay his real estate taxes, and by the way, look one other place thing here I want to mention to you real quick, like, there's a redemption period here in Missouri. It's one year, see it right there? Missouri is actually one year. There it is. Nebraska is three. But the bottom line is there's redemption periods. That means the length of time that you're probably going to have this investment out. It's not a long time. So what happens? I went over. I bought this piece of uh, this tax lien. It cost me, say, $2,000. At the end of the year, the homeowner didn't pay it. I have to write a letter to the lender and to the owner and say, I'm going to foreclose on the property. If there's a lender, the lender will always pay off the lien. And here's the reason. If the lender does not pay the back taxes to you and you foreclose on the property, remember the county always has first priority over any lien that a lender has. What happens? I get the property and guess what? The lender is history. There is no lien from a lender. It's gone. And you, in effect, get the property. Now, I've summarized this for you rather quickly. But that's what makes this investment outstanding. You cannot go wrong with this. I know you don't believe me. You're going to say, I don't believe that guy. There's no way that whole noise knows what he's talking about. But I can tell you I do. I've been doing this for a long time. I have clients in it that have been in at least 12 to 13 years, have never lost one penny in this. Now, my headache used to be that when we did this, that we could not, in fact, find anybody that would do it for you. Because you don't have the time, generally, to go look at the properties. 
You don't want to go clear up to Illinois unless your brother lives there. Uh, you don't want to go, for example, to uh, Arizona. And by the way, Arizona has a great rate. It's like 16 or 17 percent. One of my clients has three properties in Sedona. Anybody ever been to Sedona? Pretty, pretty shabby place to have a piece of property at, right? Pretty darn nice, actually. And so the bottom line is that you can actually take this money, invest it, and your redemption is normally pretty quick. But the problem has always been for me, and that was, how do I get my clients who do not want to take the time to make the investment? Where are we going to do this? So I've done an awful lot of looking, I can tell you that, and I finally found what I think is the best way to go. But I'll give you some options as well. If you go to your packet of information, there should be a flyer in there that says Comian. Look at it right here, C-O-M-I-A-N. This particular, this is a fund, by the way. How many of you are familiar with mutual funds? Can I see a raise of hands? Everybody, right? This is a type of a mutual fund. It's a closed-in fund, which means, in this particular one, the offering currently at hand, the most they'll be willing to take is $2.5 million. That's the most. Your investment can be as low as $25,000. That's the lowest that they'll take. And by the way, the best place to do this is in your IRAs. Absolutely the best place is to do it in your individual retirement accounts. Now, here's what I want to explain to you about this. And by the way, there's a website. You can even call the gal that runs it. Very, very nice gal. Kathleen is her first name. And uh, she'll be glad to talk to you about it. And you ought to call. And I bet you two to one, half of you will call me and say, she's lying. Because it just sounds too good to be true. In the most recent offering that closed, and the offering ran about 60 months, 117% return. I didn't say 17. I didn't say 12. I said 117. And I know for those of you, especially the people that are like my age, 95 and plus, well, not quite that old, but that are older are probably saying, nah, too risky. There is no risk. Did you hear what I said? There is no N-O risk. And these things are not affected by what Obama does, thank the Lord. It's not affected by the economy. It's not affected by interest rates. It's not affected by anything that's out there. That's how beautiful this thing is. And this is the type of fund that I think is probably the most best to go at. You need to do your own research. I'm not here to sell it. I'm not getting a fee. I'm not getting a commission. I don't do those sort of things. My program over 27 years on KMBZ has been only one reason to provide you education and information. You'll never hear me advertise on the program. Hey, be sure to come to see Peter Newman's CPA. I do the best tax returns in the world. I'm the best financial. You'll never once have heard me say that in 27 years. Well, not one time. I don't do that. My program is truly the only one that's only purpose is education. That's all I try to sell, is for you all to understand what your options... And by the way, I've been talking about this for years, and if you don't know anything about it, you haven't been listening. So, check it out. It's a great way to go. And by the way, if you want some books, this is the best book on the subject, written by Joel Moskowitz, The 16% Solution written in good, simple English language. I don't care whether you say, I don't understand financial books, you'll understand this book. He explains, in fact, that chart that I just showed you a minute ago, this one right here, that came out of the book. Read it, see what you think. I can give you a lot of other sources, by the way, if you want to do it. There's a guy by the name of Larry Loftus out in Florida, who will actually buy the tax liens for you. He doesn't have a big charge. For example, if you go to a state like uh, an 18% state, he charges you 2%. You make 16% on your money. The problem with it is when I first started talking to him, his required minimum was 25,000. 
and now only have four clients that are doing it. Their current minimum is 250,000, pretty heavy. Then there's another company that uh, does it as well. In fact, they should be on the program, I think, with me this Saturday, if I remember right. It's called PIP West. And they do it as well, but their fees are a little higher. This particular fund, the way I view it, is probably the best way to go. But you got to understand one thing. you got to give it at least five to six years. So if you need money, before then, don't do it. If you got an IRA and you want to put in 25, you got plenty of other IRAs out there to do your required minimum distributions, then you look at something like this. By the way, they're not up for sale yet. They have not yet gotten the offering for their prospectus to be sent out to pot potential investors. But if you have an interest, just call them up, say, you know, send us the information. You can ask the gal there any question you want. And by the way, if you find out something different than what I'm telling you, you've got my phone number there in your packet. Call me and say, hey, Pete, you told us a lie. That ain't going to happen. But I'd like, if you find out different, call me. You know, I don't want to tell you I know everything. The only thing I know for sure is I got the best wife in the world. That's the only thing I know for sure. But I don't know everything. And the bottom line is that this, though, is something you ought to look at. Remember, hey, if you want to, go home after, the, after our meeting. Go to your search on your website. Hit in tax lien certificates. And by the way, one thing I forgot to mention to you. In Missouri, for example, four weeks before the actual sale takes place, you get a complete listing of all the properties. It shows you every piece of property that each county, whether you're going to Clay, Cass, Jackson, whatever, there'll be a complete list of the properties up for sale. You can go to Zillow.com or a number of different websites and take a look at the property if you want. Uh, but you can do it all for practical matter on the internet if you want to do it. Missouri does not do their auctions on the internet, but there's a lot of states that do, in fact, do their auctions on the internet. I do think, though, if you have any interest, get the book. It's going to cost you big bucks, folks. $15. You waste more than that every day anyway. So pick it up, get it. You should be able, if you can't go to the internet, you'll find it for, like I say, about $15. That's the best book on the subject. Okay, let's talk about something else. And by the way, later on, if you've got a question, you can put it down in your questionnaire and we'll talk about it. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is my favorite subject and yours as well, Social Security. Boy, there's some people that have on the air been doing nothing but talking about Social Security as if it's something new. We've been talking about Social Security probably for 12 or 13 years, but a few people have suddenly realized that Social Security is a real way to get people to give them a call. And so they are harping big time on Social Security. By the way, it is a valid subject. I'm going to just tell you a few things that you need to know. Number one, I'd say probably more than 60% of all Americans who take Social Security and when they started was wrong, was grossly in error. And I'll explain to you here why in just a minute. But if you look at it, Currently, Social Security has loaned to the federal government $2.6 billion. Do you believe that? Of the total amount of money that's outstanding, your over-wealthy federal government owes the Social Security Administration just a $2.6 billion amount. The benefits, the real benefits, as you know, is steady income, lifetime income, inflation protected, although, by the way, we've not had any inflation adjustments for two years, we're going to probably see that again this year. We've had no increase, no COLA, cost of living adjustment. Now, how, are the, how is your benefits calculated? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but basically they use 35 years. They take a look at 35 years. If in some of those years you own zero, you had zero, you get no benefit in those years of any kind. But for all your other years of earnings, they calculate it based on inflation amount. Depending upon your age and how much you've put in, the bottom line is they calculate the amount of the benefits. Now, at what age should you really take Social Security? Can I tell you, most people think, as soon as I get there. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Huge wrong, big wrong, stupidity wrong. Unless, one qualification, 
you're very ill, you're single, and your life expectancy is about six to eight years. Yes, take it at 62. But there are so many different ways to go. Let's say you're a widow or a widower. You can start taking benefits at the age of 60. You get roughly 70% of the benefits. And the beauty of this is that when you get to be the age of 66, you can actually elect to either take your benefits on your own account or wait until you're 70 and take it then, which is actually the best. And I'll explain to you in a minute why that's the case. And by the way, if you're 60, or, you, or you, let's say you're 59 and a half, if you wanted to do this, you could make it work. You're married. You're really happily married. But you want your Social Security benefits? No problem. Get a divorce. <laughs> Two weeks later, remarry the same person. You'll get your benefits for the rest of your life. Assuming, by the way, that your income, your earned income, is under $14,160. Because earned income does affect your ability to get Social Security without having to make a refund. Now, what about, for example, if I was, if I was uh, uh, 66 years of age, which is full retirement age? First of all, if you take benefits at the age of 62, you're going to get 25% less than if you waited until 66. But now, let's say you decided, I don't really need the money. I've got savings, I've got other things. I'm going to wait. For every year that you wait until the age of 70, you're going to make 8% more on your benefits. Hey, how many of you guys are making 8% on your money? Haven't seen a raise of hand yet. Come on, raise your hand. I want to see here you are. Huh, nobody. Sure money. 8% a year. How much is 8 times 4, guys? 32? So let's just say that at age 66, you were getting 2,000 in benefits. Let's just say that. If you were getting 2,000 of benefits at the age of 66, what would you get at the age of 70? $2,640. For the rest of your life. Now, that's the simple way, and I'm going to show you how important that is, especially if you're married, and that's where it's key. Because as I indicated here, 132%. Um, let's go over here, and let me give you something. By the way, there's other things, but I want to go to something else. Um, let's take an example of how this works if you're married. Because, see, if a person is age 66 and he's married, he can actually draw on his wife's benefit if the wife is over the age of 62 and is currently drawing benefits. So look at something. Here in this example, we have John and Mary. John's benefits at age 66 are $2,296. If he waits until the age of 70, he's going to have $3,031 in benefits. That's a 32% increase. If you're not with me, holler at me because I want you to follow this through. Mary is three years younger. And in effect, at her full retirement age, she is entitled to get $890. If she waited, she'd get $1,210. The husband says, calls up the SSA and says, I do not want to take my benefits. But I do want to take half of my wife's benefits because he can do that. He can draw on his wife's account. So let's see what happens by doing that. What, well, how much down is he? by having done this at the age of 70. Let's look at it. If he takes $2,296 at age 66, if he were to do that, in four years, he'd have $110,200. If he had taken it at the age of 66, instead of waiting until the age of 70. In lieu of taking his, he takes 50% of his wife's benefits. In other words, $444. Half of that, $890. So he takes his wife's benefits. Remember, that's not his. And his wife can, can draw, by the way. And she does not need to be 66. She could be 62, and he'd still be entitled, to, as she was drawing benefits, she, he still would be entitled to draw on her benefits as if she were 66, half of them. So the bottom line is that he's going to draw $21,360 of her benefits during that four-year period. What's his shortage? 
at the age of 70, he will be down 88,848. And you say, oh, this is ridiculous. It isn't. Because if you look at this, at age 70, John is going to drive the, draw the higher amount for the rest of his life, or $735. That means he needs to live another 10 years. In other words, he needs to live until 80, and then he's going to break even. But that's only half the story. Because if he should die, his wife will also get the higher benefits for the rest of her life. So there's only one question. Will one of these people at least live to be 80? If one of them at least lives to be 80, this is the smart move. In today's world, you know, all the time, we see 90, we see 100. And of course, women always outlive us men by a lot of years anyway. So the bottom line, and this is a calculation, by the way, you have to make. You got to make this count and say to yourself, does it or does it not make sense? You know, you all have savings accounts, right? And you say in retirement, I may need to fall back on the savings. But if the savings account is only making you 1% and this is making you 8%, doesn't common sense normally tell you, use your money and then draw this and make the greater amount of money and get the greater amount of income? You know, life, of course, is an unknown but for a practical matter, if you're fairly healthy, at least one of you, say the wife is healthy and the husband's so-so, then you go for it. If you're both healthy, no question you do this. Now, the other big problem in all of this when it comes to Social Security is the taxation. You know, prior to 1985, we did not have taxation of Social Security benefits. Then one of your astute presidents said, it's time to tax Social Security, right? Let me ask you a question. When you had money drawn out of your check for Social Security, did you get a deduction for it? Nope, at least not on the federal level. So the answer is, now you do get taxed on your Social Security benefits. And depending upon what your income level is, up to 85% of your money gets taxed at the federal level for Social Security, and the bottom line is you pay a pretty decent amount, and there's the breaking point, by the way, what we call provisional income. If an individual has provisional income, which is adjusted gross income plus, including half the Social Security and half of the income from um, munis and that type of income, if it's under 25,000, no part is taxed. If it's over 25, you're gonna get 50%, if they're single, 34, they're going to get up to 85%. So those are critical, and that's something you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. That's something you need to talk to your, uh, uh, you need to talk to your uh, CPA or some financial advisor about. By the way, I want to go back just one more second on these tax lien certificates. I will lay you odds that unless you listen to our program, you've never heard of, ta or you're our clients, one or the other, You've never heard of tax lien certificates. You can ask your broker, and he'll say, what? You can ask your real estate agent, by the way. They don't know what you're talking about. I do courses for the board of realtors. Every time I have a course, I always say, hey, how many of you real estate agents have ever heard of tax lien certificates? Nobody knows. Nobody's heard of it. And the broker will never deal with you. Why? No fee, no commission. He's not going to tell you about something that's good. That isn't his responsibility. His responsibility is to get you something and more for himself maybe than you. So that's why you've never heard. Anybody here gone to a broker that says do tax lien? Say, I want to see a raise of hands. Yeah, I had a lady come in, very nice lady, and we were talking and she says, you know, my son, after I told her about it, she says, you know, my son works at that time it was Merrill Lynch because they've been gobbled up since then but back in those days when it was just Merrill Lynch she says oh my son is a broker in one of the major cities in Florida I don't remember which one it was but let's say it was Miami and she says I can assure you he knows about this he just hasn't told me about it and I said okay do me a favor he's so good and he's all this other good stuff would you do me a favor and ask him about two three weeks later uh, she called up, she had a tax question. I said, oh, by the way, did you ever talk to your son? Oh, sure, I talked to him. And he says, oh, he's really familiar. And she said, oh, by the way, can you give me the name and the phone number and the address and the information on it? Yeah, he'd never heard of it. 
And even if he had, he, did, he, he, you know, he wasn't about to tell everybody about it. That's why you don't hear about those. Okay, let's uh, quickly talk about another subject because I can see. Uh, by the way, I understand that Emily has indicated that we can have another hour and a half over and above what we originally thought. So uh, that is all right, is it not, Emily? I think she said yes. Okay, um, so let's switch to another subject. Let's talk about current tax issues. You know, we, we, you know, every one of these tax bills that come out is nothing but stupidity. Absolute, downright, ridiculous stupidity. It just makes our world more complicated. I wish these guys in government would do something that's constructive instead of changing these tax laws. In, in fact, I'm going to talk to you about getting rid of it altogether. But if they're not going to do that, leave us alone already, for God's sakes. It's complicated enough. Don't make it any more complicated. But let's look at this tax relief bill that was enacted by about February 17th of last year. What did it do? First of all, as you all know, it extended the bush cuts till 2012. After that, only the Lord knows what's going to happen. It also extended unemployment benefits. Hallelujah! For another 13 months. And here's something you all need to be aware of. Long-term capital gains. Long-term capital gains and what we refer to as qualifying dividends are taxed at 15%. However, if your tax bracket does not exceed 15% and for a single individual, if your adjusted gross, if your taxable income is under roughly 34,500 and on a joint return roughly 69,000, you pay nothing in your capital gains. Zero. Now, by the way, I, I noticed with interest, did you hear the most recent thing that Mr. Obama said about who pays taxes and doesn't? He was saying that millionaires, a lot of them, pay less tax than a lot of secretaries. No way, ho, say. There's roughly 237,000 Americans who made more than a million dollars in the year 09. That's the latest stat that we have. Of that number, about 1,470 Americans paid little or no tax. And you say, well, that's not fair. No, I agree with you. It isn't fair. But the reason that happened was they had a capital gain. Say a guy sold all of his stock in uh, Berkshire Hathaway, you know, let's just say. And he, had, and he had little cost. I had a client of mine, by the way, she's since passed away, whose husband was involved in the initial founding of Berkshire. Her cost was nothing. You know, the stock was selling 110, 115,000. Sure, she had a huge gap capital gain. And it got taxed at 15%. But that's the exception. That doesn't happen every day. If a guy's got normal income, earned income, interest, dividends, that type of thing, he's probably going to not be among those people. And by the way, the other thing is, and I thought that was so stupid what he said. That Obama needs to get his story straight. He needs to get his figures right. After all, he's got all these competent, incompetent people. Why in the heck doesn't he get the story straight for once? But the, the bottom line to what, what I'm trying to tell you here is, is, yes, we do have a rate of 35%. And this is probably going to be the max rate. It's going to probably go up. And it's definitely going to go up as we get more and more of these taxes coming into play from the Obama health care bill. By the way, did you like that Obama health care bill? It was great. <laughs> best thing that ever happened. I don't know for who, but it was the best thing that ever happened. That bill, when it gets, gets through, and by the way, did you, did you remember what uh, Obama said when that bill got enacted? It will not cause one penny of additional tax. It will all be funded by the government. No, don't you worry about it. That's just, by the way, that's the standard line. You know, I, anytime I hear that, I, you don't even have to tell me who said it. I know who said it. That's his standard verbiage. No, 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 don't worry about it. We'll get it paid for. We'll get it done. And where are we? Now, I'm not being critical because I think he has done a lot of good things. I mean, I, I'm, you know, credit is due where credit is due. But I will say that more of the bad was done than the good. But in any case, getting back to this particular bill. Uh, hey, by the way, the other good thing about this bill is the marriage penalty is, you know, I know, guys, that there is a penalty for being married. But, but I'm talking about 
the real marriage penalty where it used to be that we, if we had two individuals and they weren't married and they say had approximately the same income, they were better off to stay divorced than they were to be married. Well, finally, we got around, we got around that problem by getting relief on this marriage penalty and we continue to have that for another two years. Whether it goes beyond that, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of other good things. By the way, energy credit. I want to mention something here. Let me go one step further here about the energy credit. I want to tell you about the energy. How many have already taken, taken benefit of that energy credit? Well, if you remember, what had happened was that last year and the year before, if you bought an energy efficient air conditioner, heater, had good windows that were energy efficient, doors, those types of things, you were entitled to get a credit of 30% of the cost of those assets limited to a maximum of $1,500. Well, the good old days are gone, guys. It's changed. Here's what it is this year. It's still out there, but the maximum benefit is generally 10% of the cost. The maximum credit is $500, assuming that you hadn't already got that much in the earlier bills. So, for example, if you had purchased something a year or two ago and got a credit of at least $500 or $1,500, this will do you absolutely no good. This is only for people generally who haven't gotten it. And the credits, as you can see, are shown to you right there. And by the way, solar energy system, that is still there. It's going to continue for a period of time. 30% of the cost, there's no limit whatsoever. Okay, so, and by the way, when you do this, make sure of one thing that you get a manufacturer's certification statement. You must have that. Your preparer should be asking you for that because not everything is energy efficient. If you really want to know the facts, you go to this energystar.gov right there. See it right there? Energystar.gov. You want to know whether that piece of uh, that uh, heating or air conditioning system qualifies. And the guy that's selling it to you, by the way, says, you can be sure it does. I've not yet heard one person who bought any of these things, like an air conditioner or heating system, were always, oh yeah, the guy who put it in told me it qualifies. I'm Half of them probably never qualified. And the guy who sold it to him didn't know one way or the other. He just sold it to him, and that, that was what it is. But if you want to go to energystar.gov, there you can really find out exactly what it's all about. Let's take talk for just a few minutes about estate tax matters and how that's changed. You know, in the year 2010, in fact, I remember talking about it in the year 2002, I said at that time, the best year to die is 2010. And no question. No estate taxes, right? In effect, the law got changed a little, but not much. The people who did die in 2010 still got some real benefits out of this. But we've still got a good deal going right now, and it's hard to believe. Each individual has a $5 million estate exclusion in 11 and 12. Beyond that, I don't know what's going to happen. But let's say a husband, a wife dies. She had $3 million in assets when she died. She did not use $2 million of her available uh, exemption. When the, husband, when the next person to die, the spouse, his exemption is going to be $7 million. So we can get actually $10 million dollars of exclusion, you know, if we die. That's a pretty good, that's, and by the way, here's another perfect example of the stupidity of taxes. You work all your life. Everything you have, you basically have paid taxes for. And what happens? You can't even get away from it when you die. Right? They're going to dig it out from underneath your grave. I mean, what on God's green earth have we got going on in Washington? They need to get it for me where you die? Hey, guys, leave something to the good Lord, right? I mean, leave something. And, and, and this estate tax is just unbelievable. It's, it's absolutely the highest of ridiculousness. By the way, the most important thing I want to mention to you here is, I don't care who you are, don't get caught without having a living trust, not a will, but a living trust, a, poor, a durable power of attorney, a pour over will, and a living will. If the only asset you have is under 100000 it's in joint name with husband and wife, it's fine. Don't have a will. A will is the one item that causes more probating than anything else. Don't assume a will will get you anywhere. Okay, hey, by the way, if you look at this, 
This is the first income tax return, 1913. Simple little form. And the interesting thing about it is if you look over here and you got it in your packet. Now remember, this is 1913. If your income was between, was under uh, $50,000, you paid 1%. Between 20 and 50,000, you paid 1% tax. 1913, first time that, are, that we had tax legislation. And by the way, I love the way Congress got this enacted. First of all, we had the 16th Amendment, which basically gave the government the right to tax income. And when they first did this, they said, look at this. Nobody's going to pay any taxes. Because in 1913, who made that kind of money? Nobody. I mean, it's practically nobody. So they, they came to the country and lied, as they always do. And they said, don't worry about it, Americans. Forget it. This is a good deal because you're not going to pay any taxes. Three years later, the highest rate was 24%. You know, that's your government at work. So that's in your little packet if you have an interest to see it at all. Uh, and then, by the way, go back to 1949. You'll love this. I always put here, and you think you paid too much tax? This is 1949. Over $200,000, the rate was 91. This actually came out of the tax booklet. I had a client of mine whose dad had passed away, and he brought in some old tax returns and tax forms. This is an exact copy out of the 49 tax booklet, there was the rate. 91% on income over 200,000. But look at these whopping rates. 50%, 70%, 81, 80. So you think you're paying too much taxes? Hey, we got it made. We got it made in the shade with the rates that we're paying today. The, th the only, and I don't mind, by the way, paying taxes. Honest to God, I don't. If they would just use the money right, then I'd say, great. But if I'm going to give them money and they're going to waste it like they do, that's what makes me mad. I don't mind, I, I mean, especially me, maybe not you guys, because I owe everything I have to American and Americans. So I owe you guys, I owe the government what I pay. And I never, my wife will tell you, I get disappointed, but I do always pay it because I think it's the right thing to do and I should do it and I have to do it. But look at those rates, just unbelievably high rates. Now let's talk about the Infernal Revenue Code. Oh, excuse me, the Internal Revenue Code. That's an error. That's a typo. Um, let's look at it. It was established in 1913. What's the matter with it? Number one, it's too complicated. Number two, too long. Number, and by the way, nobody understands it. Nobody understands it. No, you could take your return to 10 different people. You'll get 13 different answers. Yeah, I mean, if at least two or three of them will say, well, do you like it this way or that way? Whatever you like, that's what you get, right? I mean, you call the shots. I don't care. And by the way, hey, believe it or not, tax preparers are now regulated. We're like doctors and lawyers. Oh, no, I don't want to admit lawyers. We're like doctors. Um, but the bottom line is now we are also regulated. There has to be continuing education. We have a number that has to go on every return. So they finally got wise. But it's too long. It's absolutely unfair. It's inequitable. It's constantly changing. And you know how many returns get filed every year? $225 million, million returns, not dollars, $225 million tax returns. Do you know how much money we're wasting in all this? How much time and how much effort we're wasting? It's interesting that the GAO, and forget about the fact that my gal didn't know how to spell government. She was tired, so she left the T off of government. But... The GAO, the Government Accounting Office, has now said for the last four years that they cannot give to anybody any assurance that the IRS records are right. I knew that all. I've known that for 50 years. And they don't know. You know, you get two people asking the same question, you get two different answers. You go to tax court, you get one answer in, on the East Coast in California. You get another answer in New York. Never the same answer. You know, it's kind of like buying a car, right? You look at the manual. It's 70,000 pages long. And by the time you get through reading it, you don't even know how to start the thing. <laughs> same, same, same exact scenario. So, but, but the real pity here is how many hours we waste. Remember earlier I told you we just had a government report that said that we spend 
billion hours a year filling out all kinds of government forms. Of that amount, six of them are done and wasted in tax return matters. You know, GE, for example, General Electric, has a team of 20,000 people in their tax department. You know what they call that particular department? A profit center. <laughs> yeah, it's a profit center for General Electric. Because they, now, it's, it's ridiculous. Now, the cost, for example, we're, we're estimating right now that we're wasting about 1,000, uh, roughly, I should say, $1 trillion of wasted money in complying with this system. Don't you all agree it's ridiculous? Yeah, I mean, we have to agree on that. You know, I've been saying for years on the radio, I want to hear one person call me and tell me that they think we've got a good infernal revenue code. Never once, and I don't believe it. But see, it's you people that's causing the problem because you live with it and you don't ever argue. You don't do it. You just sit on your ends and you don't criticize, you don't holler. If you got up and hollered and screamed, we'd get something done. Now, <laughs> uh, now, you know, and, and by the way, the other thing that this whole thing does, it creates double taxation. And here's what I mean. If you go out and buy a car, you realize that you have embedded taxes all the way along of about 22 to 24 percent. That means everybody along the way, whether it was the raw material manufacturer or the, or the, uh, car, uh, car, the car carpet uh, manufacturer, whoever, they had to make a profit, didn't they? And if they did, they paid taxes. And that meant they charged additional money in the end, which created this particular problem. So what it does is it creates double taxation. Emily, can I have another minute, or are we, do we? We're running out of time if we want to get to any questions at all. All right, well, I'll, okay, then I just want to say one more thing. It'll take another hour. Uh, <laughs> one minute, one minute. Uh, I want to mention to you only one thing, and that is there's only one way to really go in this, and there's a concept that's out there that's great. I've been a promoter of it for years, and you ought to look at it. It's called the fair tax. It's a consumption tax. It's the only way to go. We've got a lot of people in the local area who are for this. You ought to look at it. You go to, ought to go to fairtax.com, read through it. It's basically a consumption tax, a sales tax, if you will. The rate's 23% with some rebating taking place at the poverty level. We've got a great organization here in town, by the way, called fairtaxkc.com or .com, one or the other. But the bottom line is, you want to look at this fair tax. Please look at it for your good and for our good. There is a way to prevent this taxation system from killing us. And of those things that are bad, balancing the budget and the debt is number one, but certainly right behind it, without any question, is this taxation system that does not work now, will not work in the future, and if we go down the tubes, we'll be one of the main contributors for us going in that direction. Okay, I'm gonna be quiet and I'll let Emily go ahead with the questions. Thank you, Peter Newman. Well, just real quickly, I'm gonna just take a couple of the questions that I was handed recently, and the first one, you're probably not gonna be able to answer this in two minutes, but, can you give us an explanation of the Fed's operation twist today, or at least talk a little bit about it? Well, you know, the, the Fed has all kinds of different ways that they're trying to determine what they can do to solve the problem that we're faced with currently. And every time they come up with another way to do it, whether it's this twist, and I'm not gonna discuss it, I'd be glad to stay around, and tell you specifically what it is and how it works, this twist, is gonna be the same as everything else. It's gonna be worthless. For example, you guys are familiar with QE one and two. What was that, quantitative easing one or two? Bernanke has not yet given us QE three, but when he does, he will have written the end of what we know as a good life. One more QE two, this will be number three, and that's why Bernanke hasn't done it yet. He knows all we need is one more and that'll roast us.
But I will, if you stay around with me, whoever asks that question, I'll be glad to answer it because it's going to take any more than one minute or two. Uh, on the tax lien auction that you were talking about earlier, somebody asks, what if more than one party bids on a property? How does that work? Good question. So here's the question. I went out and I bid on a property and the, and the amount up was $1,000. And they say, okay, Mr. Newman, it's yours. Is there anybody else who wants to bid it up? Somebody in the audience says, I want to bid 1100 And let's assume there's another person that says, I'm going to bid 1000 too. Well, what happens is this. Number one, you actually end up paying the 1300 whichever was the highest bidder. But here's the headache. Most states, but not all, will not pay any additional interest on the bid up. Now, in Missouri... I'll show you how different it is. At one time, Cass County was paying on this bid up that of $300 here, was paying 8% on that and 10 on the basic thousand. If you'd gone up to Clay County, they paid nothing on the bid up. But see, if you're in a state like Illinois, so what? What if I'm paying another town? I got a lot of working room to get me down to three or four percent. But the, it is true, you'll get your money, by the way. When the thing ultimately gets paid, you'll always get that. But there'll be no interest normally on the bid up. Here's a question on flexible spending accounts or FSAs. Yes. Are we going to have those in 2012? Well, you know, the problem with these accounts, whether it be flexible spending or any other accounts, we don't know how long any of them are going to be around. We just don't know. Uh, I think the, uh, frankly, I think the best thing other than the flexible spending account is the HSAs, the health savings account. If you're going to do anything at all, you're much better off to do the HSAs. They're not available, by the way, if you're on Medicare, I will tell you that. But for those of you who are not, the health savings account are the best way to go for medical coverage. It works just like an IRA. You put your money in, a part of it, the, the premiums are much lower because the deductibles are higher, and you put money directly into a, quote, IRA, for which you do get a deduction, by the way, and when you take the money out for medical purposes, you pay no tax on the withdrawal. So if you're really looking for something that's good, let's look at the HSAs, and they're still viable, doable, and workable. Here's somebody who's working part-time and asks, how much of their income can they put into a Roth IRA? Good question. In fact, I really wanted to spend a lot of time on Roth. I didn't get a chance to do it. If you have earned income at any age, even if you work till 95, my wife says I can retire at 96, so I'll be doing it in 95. An individual between the ages of 50 and up can put away, as long as they have earned income, $6,000 a year. Under the, that age, it's 5000 but you must have earned income. And by the way, all of you, I don't care who you are, if you had earned income, you should have always been doing Roth IRAs, even if you were in a qualified plan. All it is is a savings account. And the savings account, as long as you at least have it, is not going to have any taxes of the earnings, provided you have it in there at least five years or over the age of 59 and a half. And by the way, one of the big issues these days, again, I don't have time to talk about it, is should you and how much should you convert of your regular to a Roth? A Roth is absolutely the best thing you can do. And you can do it as long as your adjusted gross income on a joint return is 167000 or less, and on a single return approximately one hundred and ten or 112000 Everybody who has earned income, even if you're in a plan, should do a Roth IRA. And by the way, where? In a tax lien certificate. I like how you com comboed those two. <laughs> that was good. Um, and then our final question, what is the income level at which we're considered rich? That's a, you know, I don't know the answer to that. You, I check with Mr. Obama. He says 250. I mean, I, I don't know. I can't, there, there is no flat out answer, yes or no. You know, I mean, that's the, that's the guideline he gives us. If you're 250, you're rich, right? Because then all the benefits that might accrue to you is at that level. You know, I think rich is really a question that's relative to an individual. For example, I think I'm rich. Not because of my money, and I really mean this when I say it, and my wife is here, because I've got a heck of a great wife, and she's my best asset bar none, and I'm rich, truly rich, because of that reason. 
Now, some of you only may think money makes you rich, but there's so many other things in life that are so important that makes us rich. We're rich, all of us, because we live in America. That's what makes us rich. Thanks for coming tonight, everybody. Please remember to turn in those green cards that were in your packet. Uh, come back on October 12th for Adam Bold, and stick around and talk to Peter for a few moments if you like. Thanks so much. <laughs>